Okay, just so everybody knows, it's getting recorded somewhere, whether it's here or on another machine or in the cloud someplace. Unless I'm woefully mistaken, we ought to be on chapter six. So first question is going to be something along the line of, um, how do you keep up, how do you remember everything that you've got to take care of, uh, whether it is about remembering information for a test, whether it's about remembering information for scheduling, whether it's about information related to whatever. How do you manage all that? Wow. That means that either everyone is doing it exceptionally well or not at all. Or some small variation in between there somewhere. How do you keep up with all that stuff? Just short-term memory? Short-term memory and putting it on a calendar, okay? Yes, and we're approaching the center from two different ends, which is good, that's fine. Short-term memory to a degree, and we'll talk about short-term memory specifically in just a bit. What else? The challenge with using a calendar is to be sure to remember to use it. Or remember where or what sort of um, tool you're using to keep up with things. As an example, calendaring is one thing. If your calendar has enough room or a space that allows you to add, we'll call them random things so that you can go back and actually take that piece, whatever it happens to be, plug it in somewhere else to make it a task or whatever. Uh, I had a, an assistant once upon a time that loved to use Google Keep. And that was a place I could, I could just dump. It was brain dump, whether it was Facebook search, uh, writing topics, or pieces related to writing. It was just basically a giant list. But it got it out of my head so that I wasn't trying to hold it all the time. You follow? Now, for me to do all of that, um, it wasn't so much about, okay, somebody's telling me that they can't hear. Down to down to down to down to down. Hold on. Huh? If, if I, I do, do that, that, that help? Maybe we got, got some feedback. If I do it that way. Hold on. That should take care of that. Now, can you hear now? Everybody should be able to hear. The echo should have gone away. Okay, good. Keeping up with all that information in your head, uh, I will just be the first one to tell you is impossible. That's not something that most of us, in fact, probably none of us are able to do on a consistent basis. It would be a wonderful thing if we were able to do all that, but most of us cannot. I have trouble remembering um, if I'm supposed to be at a certain place at a certain time, depending on the week. My wife doesn't tell me things until I need to know them. Um, it's not that she's trying to keep things from me, but she knows that I will not keep up with miscellaneous, just loose details about having to be, if I'm supposed to be um, at a meeting a month from now, she is not going to worry about telling me about that meeting until probably at least two weeks out. She's going to make a reference to it. She'll also make sure that there's nothing in my calendar that day, and then she'll mention it a day or two beforehand. And if things go well, I might remember it the day I get out of bed. Now, that doesn't say anything poorly about me, per se. It tells you what I decide in my brain is worth keeping in there and what's not. Her telling me that I'm supposed to be somewhere a month from now, don't bother. Even if she writes it down, doesn't matter. I'm not going to worry with that sort of stuff right now because that's not time. To, as she would put it, you don't need to know that yet. So she doesn't tell me yet. It works out great for us. It's a great system. It doesn't always work for everybody else.
Ah, yes, I can. So I will take care of that for you, Ms. Dow. The, but how we deal with that piece of information or those pieces of information when, we, when they manage to get into our little brains is a process called encoding. It basically means that we process that information in such a way that we can um, retrieve it later. I think I probably mentioned earlier that when I say earlier, as in earlier in the semester, uh, most of us really don't have a memory problem when it comes to remembering information for tests and things like that. What we have is difficulty retrieving the information. The information is in there. It's about being able to reach back into the right memory folder and bring that folder to the front of the filing cabinet so that we can access that information. We do that through a process called encoding. We use acoustic cues, we use visual cues, we also use semantic cues, all kinds of stuff that we use to deal with that. How we store it is a different challenge altogether. Look at your brain as a ginormous filing cabinet. Each subject or each folder becomes a particular topic. And you have different folders, perhaps, even inside that ginormous folder. So again, it depends on how you catalog your information. Make sense in the grand scheme of things? Uh, retrieval is that ability to reach into the back and pull that information to the front like you need it, which is also about recall. Recognition. Um, there's a process referred to that's called priming. Um, those of you who've ever driven what would now be considered antique cars, um, when they didn't have fuel injection, if you ran out of gas, you, it would help you if you put a little bit of gas in the carburetor first. You had to prime it, it's what we called it. Do the same thing with memory. Sometimes just a little bit of piece of information can be very helpful in triggering the rest of the memory that you might require. We use what's called episodic memory, simply meaning that we remember episodes of particular things. Usually those events are the ones to which we were present. It's really kind of, it's much more difficult to remember an event where you weren't, as it were. It sounds kind of weird when you say it like that, I suppose. Um, semantic memory is what we call generalized knowledge. It's not always tied to a specific event. Procedural memory is just what it sounds like. It's the memory about how to do things. Even at your age, we'll say anywhere between 18 or 19 and 25, and we've probably got one or two here or there that are old, older than that. Um, how many of you consciously think about what you do when you get in your car to go? Do you consider things like, I will unlock the car so that I may get in it? Not asking you how you do that, but you manage to get into your car. Some of you will take a key or a fob, or some of you will take a push a button. Somehow or other, you will engage the engine of the car. The rest of that's how that's going to work, just to get the thing started. Some of you will mess with dials on the radio or your CD player or roll down your window or whatever it is you do. At some point, somebody is going to reach down and engage the transmission so it goes forward or backward. To make it go forward or backward, it will do that at idle. Or you must put, do what? Put your foot on the gas pedal and encourage it along a little bit. Then you will change direction. If, you, if you're backing up, you're going to turn around and drive forward, I would assume. When you get to the first place of an intersection where you need to make some sort of decision to what extent you will stop or not stop, you will engage what? The brake, I hope. Then you'll make another decision. Are you gonna turn right? Are you gonna turn left? Are you gonna yield or you're not? How many of you folks consciously think through each one of those steps? If you do, you are a mighty special individual. We don't think about that stuff. We get in the car and go. Now, that may not be in our best interest, but we don't think about some of those procedural things we do in life every day. How many of you consciously think about, I will cut up my piece of meat with these two hands using these two instruments. And again, that sounds goofy until you find yourself with someone who can no longer do that, or by chance you can't do it for yourself. How do you eat? Can you eat left-handed? If you're a right-handed person, can you eat the other way? I cannot. 
It doesn't work like that. I can't do a number of things with the other hand. At the same time, there are also a number of things that I do left hand that I don't usually think about. I'm a right hand dominant person who uses my left hand to do a great many things, like carry stuff, my backpack or my book bag or whatever, left hand always. If I'm in an airport, it'll be in both hands because I'm tired of wagging it on one side or the other. But that's because I'm a little OCD and I balance things out from side to side. See, we do all of that kind of stuff in different procedural ways that match our own particular style. Um, how many of you are athletes? There'll be some on the line that are athletes or who are athletes, I'm assuming. Do you, what sport is it that you play? Baseball. I play softball. A softball, you play how much soccer? Soccer. How many of you think about, I'm going to leave the, ladies, I'm going to leave the bench and I'm going to walk up to the plate. What are you going to do next? I'm looking, you have a particular something that you're going to do, whatever habit it happens to be. Professional major league baseball players, a lot of those guys will tap their cleats with a bat. Okay. That's part of the ritual or the procedure they use when they get to the plate. All of you have a procedure for how you get to the batter's box and what you do when you get there. Do you consciously think, now I will do X, Y, and Z? Is it kind of like muscle memory? Yes, it is very much like muscle memory. Your body just assumes its procedure and goes on about its business. But again, those are things we don't typically think about. That is going to involve procedural memory, to, if you're looking at it from a muscle memory perspective, or um, procedural memory and semantic memories, things that we just do. Those of you who are into shooting firearms, do you think about the fact that, you, assuming you have it in all circumstances first, um, that you're going to reach with whichever hand you pull, draw with, pull it up, point, shoot, how you grab the, the, the grip, whatever. Do we think about that? No, we just pull the gun and we do our thing, whatever it happens to be. A student asked me earlier today, are you going hunting this weekend? First off, I had forgotten that it was hunting season. Second of all, I have a new rifle, I do, but it doesn't have a sight on it because I'm supposed to go get a scope for it. Okay, I haven't slowed down long enough to go buy a scope. Is that gonna do me any good to go hunting? No. I can point the firearm in some general vicinity of some varmint or deer or whatever else. Is it going to work? No, not unless I get real lucky. Because the procedure I need to use to make all that happen is not working well at the moment. It's, it's down my list of things to take care of today, basically. Some of the other challenges we deal with on a consistent basis involve what we call explicit or implicit memories. Deliberate attempts to remember rely on that explicit memory. We are consciously trying to remember something, whether it's a procedure, whether it's a piece of data or whatever. Now, implicit memory is, involves the unintentional recollection and influence of the prior experience, what we've done with the memories before. Implicit memory is an automatic response. A lot of times the explicit memory is unaware at all that, of what the implicit memory is taking care of. I mentioned the, the priming or the unconscious improvement of a memory by providing a little bit of information. How do you learn how to do those things that we do automatically, like drumming or play soccer or play softball or ride bucking horses or bulls or whatever people do? How do you, how do you learn how to do that? Repetition over and over and over. Ask a professional basketball player what he does when he's practicing. You'd be surprised how many of them practice free throw. Some of them should practice free throw. Some of them don't do as well. Now, if you watch one of those persons do that, men or women, that person will approach the foul line and do whatever that person does as a part of their ritual. I'm, now, I'm using that word loosely. They will do, you know, some folks will dribble the ball three times. They hold it a certain way. It'll spin in their hand and they assume some sort of position and they go, Psh. and they can tell you when the ball doesn't go in, they will be able to tell you what part of that series of events they didn't do appropriately. Don't know exactly when it rolls off the hand. That's not even good. Why bother? It's not going in this time. 
that's because they do it over and over and over again. There are people um, who've gotten the, the uh, there's a, an older, long since dead, I believe, uh, college basketball coach. All he drilled was fundamental. The rest of the stuff would take care of it. And he'd have a scholarship student say, oh, well, the coach, I can make that five foot bank shot. I know you can. And, and you're going to make it 400 more times before you go to the next shot and make that person shoot that particular bank shot 400 times. It becomes muscle memory so that they do those things automatically. And we, do, we deal with the memory that's necessary to manage all of that in a number of different ways. Some we deal with the levels of processing that are necessary for us to do that, whether it's something like maintenance rehearsal, repeating a process over and over again. Uh, when it comes to learning information, like you might need for general psychology, um, to do maintenance rehearsal, meaning that you repeat information over and over again, and you do that for a lot of other classes, right? Go to history class. You better know the information, boom, on this date, this happened. There's no variation on that, right? The only way to learn it is to memorize it. So you memorize and then you regurgitate that information back for a test. Now, if I was having you do a test in the classroom, it would be something similar. Okay. But with something like my particular class, anyway, the idea of having I wouldn't, it's not necessary to remember bits and pieces of information when you have an act, when you have access to a book that will give it to you. And in our case, because it is not, this is a general broad scattershot of general psychology. I'm not going to ask you to memorize bits and pieces, dots and tittles and little details. It's not that important. If I ask you a question that's a little more detail oriented, you're gonna have your textbook anyway. So I don't worry about that. But other classes, you have to memorize and give information back. That is the worst way, statistically speaking, to learn information. What that translates into in some very plain language, it's not really that helpful. Especially if you're doing it in a hurry. If you wait till the night before and you start trying to memorize 14 lists of things, guess what? You're not going to remember too much. And you're going to, going to get to the test, you're going to get frustrated because what you think you're going to recall will be out of order or whatever else, and you get frustrated. When you get frustrated, then you're going to lose other pieces of information and things will not work well. That notion of maintenance rehearsal is just not that helpful. It's not a very effective way to create lasting memory. On the other hand, if you do a process called elaborative rehearsal, that's a little different. It involves thinking about how new material relates to other things that we already know. As goofy as it might sound, the information that you use to drive relates to information that you have in your brain that you don't think about to walk. You've learned other pieces of information that deal with body function that help you when it comes to things like driving. The challenge is that you're not consciously connecting those pieces of information. If I can talk to you about what it's like for someone who deals with Parkinson's disease, if you have experience with someone who's dealt with Parkinson's disease, and we talk about what happens to the human body when dopamine starts uh, fading away, what you think about that will be different because of your experience. How challenging it is related to uh, their potential levels of dementia or whatever else that occurs in later stages of Parkinson's disease. Same principle with Alzheimer's. Your experience with an individual who has Alzheimer's will influence what you think and how you remember information related to it. If you've had someone in your family, a grandmother or a grandfather who has died as a result of having a condition called Alzheimer's, you will remember very specific things about the um, about the later experiences you had with them. Will you remember the earlier ones? To some degree, sure. Will you remember the more recent ones? Certainly. Because that's, you're connecting feeling, what things feel like, to pieces of information. The more pieces of stuff you can connect to information you need to recall, the more easily accessible that information is. So if you can remember how things make you feel, what you see, you see a car accident on TV, what's that make you feel? You have a certain physiological response. 
then at the same time, when you see something else, it might trigger that emotion or that particular memory. It takes you back to that particular episode, which is why something like PTSD becomes so stressful. People encounter a similar circumstance. It triggers a series of memory or a series of physiological responses about what we felt like in the middle of that event, whatever it was. There are some of those events, I had a visiting with a lady yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, I was supposed to do a clinical interview and a couple of uh, assessments with her. She was giving me a little bit of symptomology that was suggestive of a condition we call schizophrenia, but she wasn't able to commit. Well, what kind of symptoms do you have when you, when you think you're being somewhat schizophrenic? Because of all the bad experiences I've had in my life. That's not, that doesn't tell me anything. Well, I'm anxious. What, are you being anxious or is that anxiety related to some other condition? And we would do this question and answer thing back and forth, me trying to get to what her issue was. I'm just so anxious about stuff because of all of my difficulties in life. What kind of difficulty? And then she'd give me another piece of information, but not the event that started the series of thoughts or concerns or feelings or whatever else. She wasn't able in her mind to connect those dots. She's having a little bit of reality testing issue is what we would call it. Now, over a period of time, she again, make a comment about being anxious. How do you know you're anxious? Well, because all those bad experiences I had in my life. Okay, what happens to your body when you're anxious? Oh, my stomach hurts. Now we're getting somewhere. What else happens to your body when you're feeling such and so? And she'd tell me about another something that happens in her body. She'd tell me about some other circumstance that would trigger another piece of information and go back and forth, back and forth, trying to figure out what it is she's trying to communicate with me. Or at the end of the day, is she lying altogether? It becomes a very interesting challenge when you're trying to figure out what people are trying to communicate with to you or with you. Now, there's another process we call transfer appropriate processing. Put that in very plain English. It is far easier for you to recall information when you can place yourself in the same conditions where you learned it. If you can create the same feeling you had when you learned it. In other words, you're connecting different pieces through similar experiences. If a student, you know, as an example, if a student understands they're going to have a test that's coming up, it's going to be multiple choice, then that student may use a particular encoding strategy that would help memory retrieval when it comes to answering multiple choice questions. The same coding strategies, however, might not work if that person is going to be asked to write an essay about the same material. You see the difference, that's important. How you've got it logged in there is important, which then suggests this, different modalities of learning are going to be much more, uh, are going to facilitate much better learning across different domains. In other words, if you can recall a list of information from history, the next time you have to recall that information and you need to put it in the form of an essay, if you can remember the list, chances of you being able to put that list into an essay format are a whole lot easier than if you didn't have a list anyway. So you're, again, you're putting together different forms of information and then encoding it in different ways to help you keep those things connected. It's like grown up connect the dots. If you can connect one piece of information to another piece of information to another piece of information, at the end of the day, you're going to get where you need to go. If, it's, if you have trouble connecting those sorts of things, you'll find that memory can be a little bit more challenging. Now, what do you do with new information, new data that gets into your system? Now we're headed toward this short-term notion of short-term memory. Our sensory memory is exactly what that sounds like. It holds information related to our five senses, but we only hold it in our brains long enough to process it so that we do what we're supposed to do with it and move on to something else. All of the memory that you use to process the sentence I just said is long gone already. It's already moved on. Your brain has cataloged that and moved on to something else. 
Now, you may not consciously think about it that way, but a lot of that has to do with how you process the information. We use our selective attention, which is when we focus our mental, our mental resources only on part of a particular stimulus field. We're not looking at the grand picture. We're looking at a very small, a much smaller piece of information when we're choosing to be very selective about what we attend to. There's a, a process referred to as inattentional blindness. There's a lot of things in life we don't see because our brain does not need that information to continue. There's a lot of information you don't see when you drive, which is why some people have accidents. Some of that's conscious, some of it not so much. Short-term memory specifically is a limited form of our memory and the information about how long this is varies. I've heard it be as short as one to two seconds. Your textbook probably said it's as many as 15 to 18 seconds. So short-term memory is a handful of seconds. We'll split the difference and say about eight and call it good. If you haven't done something with that piece of information in between five and eight seconds, it's going to, what's called, it's going to decay. It's going to go away. That's what's going to happen to it. It's just going to fade away and nothing's going to happen. It'll just disappear and you'll never be the worse for wear. Our working memory is what we're using in real time, working with our data. One of the tests that I use on a consistent basis tests short term memory, long term memory, working memory, visual field, delayed memory processing, all kinds of stuff. But one of the tools that we use as a part of that process is a series of blocks. They're red and white. They are split in, in half, but some sides are all red, some sides are all white, and some sides are both red and white. You show them a picture of some blocks that are put together to make a design. You ask the client, make this for me. You clock that, see how long it takes them, if they can put it together. So I've had some people put things together upside down, not be able to put things together at all, um, as well as get everything perfectly right the first time around. Um, what's happening is that as the sensory information, red and white block, the tactile experience of holding the red and white block, um, the eyesight experience of seeing the red and white block, all of that stuff while you're sitting in the chair to do the exercise, formulates what you do with the information about the red and white block. When people can't put it together appropriately, that doesn't mean they're stupid what, or dumb or whatever pejorative term you want to use for that. What that means is that when the information gets in, information about the red and white block gets in between their ears, their brains don't know what to do with it or how to process it in such a way that the hands then produce the appropriate response which means that that is about processing. That is not about how smart or less smart they are. IQ tests are about what you do with information and the potential capability you have with that information, not how smart you are. So when they talk about Einstein having 160 odd IQ, that's all really fine and well. But Einstein was also an interesting fellow. He didn't worry himself with what he wore every day. He wore the same clothes every day. He had seven sets. So they didn't lose time or waste up memory space thinking about, oh, well, I wear a white shirt today or a blue tie or whatever. He wore the same thing all the time. You'll find that people with exceptional memory and exceptional um, intelligence quotients like Einstein or other people often are a little more quirky in other areas of their world because they don't waste brain space on those little quirky things. I've known people who worked for big think tanks way back in the day. And one of this one lady I know, her job was to make sure that when people left her building, her office, to go to a meeting, that they had their clothes on. For real. These people would sit in a room with no furniture and look out the window and get paid a million dollars a year to think about stuff. And that's what they did. They didn't think about putting on the clothes. They were getting paid to think about solving problems related to outer space or whatever it was they were doing. She was to make sure that they had their clothes on, 
and had the materials they required for their meeting, it was her job because they weren't thinking about that sort of stuff. They were focused very selectively on what they were working on. So they didn't worry about the other memory pieces. Their short-term memory was minuscule. Their working memory was not much better. But their ability to reach into the back, into that filing cabinet, and pull information from there way up to the front, then do something with that was exceptional. So there's a lot of different ways that we deal with that memory, how we encode it, how long it is we use it while we're encoding it. If I ask you what's two plus two, all of you are going to say four, boom, you're not going to think twice about it because you know after practice, after however many years, that two and two is four. Take somebody who knows how to work math in an abstract space and they can make two plus two equal something besides four. But that steps into a different form of memory, how to manipulate those sorts of things. When you're having trouble remembering big pieces of information, that have lots of little pieces behind them, you use a process called chunking. You group them together. Oh, you bet. Shoot to me. Right. Short answer to your question. I'm going to see if I can rephrase your question just a little bit, make sure I have it right. If I understand correctly, the question is, as we age, is it still possible for us to adjust our memories in such a way that we don't decline? Is that what you get? Okay, good. Short answer, yes. Um, we can do that. Um, the challenge is being consciously aware of the technique that you require to do that. What I require to do that may be a different set of tools than you require. Does that make sense? The, the, the overall process would include things like um, elaborate rehearsal, connecting different pieces of information together in a way that works for you, whereas how I put them together in a way that's beneficial to me would likely be different. Again, it's about learning how you learn well. That process is called metacognition. It's when you think about thinking, thinking about how it is you think. Those sorts of, and how those pieces fit together. So you would, if you were going to study a process like that, you would need to consider um, learning about how people learn, learning about how adults learn, versus learning like, like children learn. So you go back to the, when did you learn, rephrase, when did you start learning your multiplication tables, assuming you did that? Education may have changed in that regard. Did you ever have to learn what one times one is? One times two? Third. One? Okay, what grade? Third. Second, third grade? Outstanding, I didn't see a multiplication table I was in third grade. So that means that at least that part of my education and yours is the same. All right, now, how did you learn them? Sorry? Repetition, over and over. And I'm going to assume, which is dangerous, that many of you, if not all of you, probably had someone working with you, whether you were using flashcards or they just asked you or whatever. I remember sitting on my couch in my living room when I was in the third grade, my mother asked me, what's nine times nine? I don't know. Sure you do. Now, I'm not gauging the quality of her teaching skill. We were not worried about teaching skill. Well, we were going through the process. One times nine is nine. Two times nine is 18. Three times nine is 27. And we did this over and over ad nauseum until I think I will die. Now, did I learn them effectively enough to pass the multiplication test that I needed to pass when it was time? I guess so. They moved me to the next grade. You know, that, was I consciously thinking about that? I was not. That's what I'm getting at. We don't think a lot about how we learn. We just do it. And the process, getting back to this question, the process of learning how we learn is a very important thing for us. 
not just you and I in the classroom, but for grown-ups in general. A good, another example is it, it veers off the pathway just a tad. There are different types of skills that we can possess. Some people in different parts of the world use a different set of skills than people use in the United States. As an example, there's a guy whose name is Sternberg. He's done educational research all over the planet. There, and he's discovered that there are certain skills in certain cultures that not everybody shares. How many of you know how to manage fire? Loose fire, not just go to the stove and turn on the gas and get fire. I mean, fire. Outside, supposed to go make one, let's manage that and take care of it. I got one over here. How many of you were taught that skill? Two or three, maybe. Okay, now go to Africa, in certain places of Africa, your ability to manage fire is going to determine whether or not you live or die. The use of that fire in that culture is different. So it requires a different set of skills. It's not, it's not like they reach out in their pocket and pull out their bic, flick a bic and start their fire. They have other stuff they have to do. They cook on their fire. I'm not saying that there are those of us over here who cannot do that. But in general, the cultural need is so different that it requires a different set of skills. So if I want to take uh, uh, an academic assessment, a test of someone to Africa, the test that I gave that lady yesterday is not going to translate into that culture because they're using a different set of tools. Does that make sense to you? That's important. Knowing how you learn as an individual, much less as a culture, is extremely important, which is why they even include it in this notion of, of general psychology. Um, one of the things that we do as part of our test is that we string together some numbers and letters sometimes and ask them to repeat them. Now it's not, you know, and you're at one part of the test, you're supposed to say exactly what I say, one nine, and the person's supposed to say one nine. The average numbers, the average amount of numbers people can remember and then articulate back is somewhere between four and seven. Now, we can do as many as nine or ten. Very rarely can I find somebody who can string those numbers together like that. Because what happens if I ask you to try three, five, three, eight, eight? All of you are already going three, five, three, eight, eight. Three, five, three, eight, eight. You're doing that over and over in your head. Are you not? You're rehearsing it. Well, when I'm testing you for that, I need you to give it to me now, not in a minute. The lady I was testing yesterday would mumble it. Three, five, three, eight. And she'd go, three, five, three, eight, eight. Don't practice, give me the numbers. She never could, she could not get there. She could not not practice. So I had to not count that because she wasn't doing it appropriately. I need you to give me the numbers backward. <laughs> And that's fine. If I give you one, two, and you're supposed to give them to me backward, what are you going to tell me? Two, one. Now, that makes sense to me because I do that every day, all day. Now, was she able to give it back to me backward? Up to about three, three numbers. After three numbers, she was out. She's lost. When she was supposed to give them back to me from smallest number to largest number, that one blew her mind. I give her, give her four numbers that are up, one, 12, not 12 always single digit, you know, one, seven, three, nine. And she's supposed to give it back to me, one, three, seven, nine, because that's the smallest to the largest. She'd look at me, we'd start with nine, whatever. It, she didn't encode information like that. Is that related to an emotional issue she's dealing with? In her case, likely. But it doesn't always work with the people that way. So your ability to keep little bits of information in your head will vary depending on the person. When you need to group things together to help you remember, again, that process is called chunking. Now your long-term memory lasts forever. Again, it's not about memory. It's about your ability to retrieve the information and that's different. The, the long-term storage capacity of the human brain is unknown. We do not know how much information the human brain can store. Now, if you think about it this way, it's not like they can cut your head open and peel back a certain part of your brain and see all of your memories in there either, do they? It's not like it's chips from a computer. 
it, it's the neurons and things in different parts of your brain catalog that information for you. It's an extremely complicated process physiologically. Now I'll make it sound a little bit easier because I'm taking the, the view and bringing it way back out instead of really, really small. Um, if you go to, if you have, how many of you, when you need to run to the store to pick up two or three things, and when I say two or three things, I mean two or three things, not 12, two or three. Now, some of you will write that down, which is probably wise. Others of you will blow it off so I can remember three, and you'll get there and will not be able to remember the third one. Okay? Now, you will remember on your list the things you wrote down last before you will remember the things you wrote down first. In other words, you'll remember the end of your list before you remember the front of your list, regardless of how long it is. That's called primacy effect. The thing that we have most recent in our brain is what we'll remember first. If you have trouble remembering other things on your list, you can uh, do a process called, uh, what do they call it? It's a location principle. If you need to remember that you've got a loaf, that you need to get your loaf of bread, I didn't ask if it's white bread or brown bread, if it's bread, put it in a different place in your house. You might remember to pick up a loaf of bread if you've got it sitting on the arm of your couch in your mind's eye instead of on a list. Or if you need to get some yogurt, you know, put your yogurt in the medicine cabinet in your bathroom. You'll remember the medicine cabinet in the bathroom and the yogurt before you remember it's listed on a piece of paper or in Evernote or whatever it is you use, Google Keep, whatever. Some of us do all that. We write it, we put it on a list this way, we write it down. <laughs> My wife should keep a running grocery list. Okay, fine, knock yourself out. I don't worry about that list while I'm headed to Walmart or wherever I'm going. We don't buy groceries where we live, it's too expensive. So she knows I'll get to it. If I'm out of it, I'll go sooner, of course. Um, but she doesn't, she writes it down. Now, do I move it to my phone? Sometimes. Does she send me a text sometimes that has a list in it? Yes. I, you know what? I keep that so that I'll remember what I'm supposed to get there. Because I'm thinking about what chapter is next in my general psychology class. I'm thinking about trying to decide if this lady I was visiting with yesterday is really anxious and in some condition called schizophrenia or not. Um, how do I, am I going to get to my next appointment on time? I'm supposed to do an assessment at 11. I need to be there early enough to be sure I'm ready to go. I'm not worried about the grocery list. Now, I use the information on the grocery list in a way that's helpful for me so that I can get to it to do what I need to do with it. That's all about my long-term memory, how I encode that information, that primacy effect, um, the primacy effect is about remembering things at the front of the list. The recency effect is remembering things at the end of the list. So how do you retrieve the memory? As goofy as it sounds for me to tell you to reach into your brain filing cabinet and pull it to the front works real well for some people. If your memories are set up in the filing system. If I ask you how to write a five-paragraph theme, what are you going to tell me? I hope your English teacher has told you something along the line of an introduction, three supporting paragraphs, and a conclusion. Is that a five-paragraph theme? Your memory works the same way. Your memory, you can make outlines for your memories, and they work marvelously well for some people. Other people doesn't work like that. Again, it depends on what works. How is it going to be most easily retrieved for you? Are you dealing with a concept or a specific piece of information? You're trying to diagnose someone with a particular issue or other. It's about the process and all of the little pieces of information that go together to make a big piece. But it's still cataloged. You follow? It's like having major depressive disorder. After, that's my big topic, major depressive disorder. Underneath that, I could have things like mild, moderate, severe. So now I got three more. The overall characteristics for mild, moderate, and severe are the same. The difference is their level or the degree. 
Do they have just two or three symptoms? Do they have four or five symptoms? Do they have six, seven, or eight symptoms? It becomes mild, moderate, severe. Do they have psychosis? Do they not have all of that is in categories underneath major depressive disorder. So the person who types for me knows if I write MDD, that means major depressive disorder, and she doesn't write down anything else. Because she, if I haven't written it down, she knows that I'm not done with that. And I'll fill it in later. If I am positive, I'll write down MDD, recurrent, severe, with psychosis, or whatever it is, and the appropriate numerology that goes with that. She doesn't go with anything more than what I give her. That's not what she's charged to do with it. Her job is just to take it from written form into typed. That's all she does. If, it, if what I have written down doesn't make sense, she highlights it and types it the way she reads it, which by the way, can be really strange sometimes. When I'm scratching stuff in a hurry and they're giving me symptoms or whatever else, I will take an extra note for myself in the margin. Okay, no worries. Does she know where that margin note goes? The assumption is probably close to where I was thinking about that at the time, but not always. Her friend was telling me yesterday, I lost my, she came in my office. This is a great example. She came in my office, said, how are you today? Oh, and she went absolutely to pieces. It's terrible. My mother died today. Okay. Let's talk. Whoa, hello. You're what? My mother died today. Why don't you have a seat? Let's talk about that. I'm supposed to interview this woman and assess her. Let's just say that she's probably not in the best place for me to do an assessment right now. Now, I told her that. We ought not, we ought to reschedule this for another time. No, 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 we gotta do it today. Why? Because I have a ride, I had a ride today. I won't have a ride next time. I'm sorry, how come? And she gives me another piece of information. So we do this information exchange, like I was telling you all ago, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the whole time, I'm having to add this piece of information to this piece of information, to this piece of information. And she st she'd be telling me all this stuff, and she said, oh, my dad died, da 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 So wherever I was, I scribbled that down. Dad, 1995, or whatever it was. And before she finished that sentence, she'd given me three more. I lost my cousin. And what she meant when she says she lost, she didn't lose them, they died. I've been known to ask people, where did you lose them? Or does that mean that they died? I mean, again, it depends on the context that we're dealing with because sometimes they lose people, not because they're dead, but because they lost them somewhere. They wandered off or whatever. She gave me half a dozen people. I'm three or four stages past when we were talking about deceased relatives or whatever else. So where do I start? I stick that. I just wrote it down where I was. Now, when that report comes back to me, it's going to be highlighted where I have it in the written part. Then I've got to remember where it's really supposed to go. And I'll remember because the format for the interview doesn't change. And the person who types could have actually stuck it where it needed to go, but she's not going to assume that she's correct. She's typed for me long enough to know where it goes. But again, it's about how we process or retrieve information. And if you don't know how it is you process it or how it is you retrieve it well for yourself, then you're gonna have a little more difficulty. Please remember that your memory is context dependent. You're not going to remember your classroom experience when you're having a fight with your significant other. And that person is trying to teach you something new. You're going to be focused on that. The context is different, which again goes back to the things like my wife not giving me things to know until I need to know them. It's, the context is not appropriate. We're always depending on context and the linking of pieces of information. If we can't link them together, we're going to have much more difficulty keeping them cataloged in our brains however it is you catalog them. How many of you deal with your memories in a picture? Anybody? You should try it sometime. Try it sometime, just for fun. Create an image that works for you related to whatever topic. And I need to remember to bring my mind maps so that you can see what I'm talking about. 
when I was trying to remember the principles related to uh, Freud and psychoanalysis, I drew a picture of my friend, Dr. Freud. It's an image picture that I used, I would doodle when I was a kid and made up this goofy face. Had a real big nose, had a one curly Q sprout for a hair, you know, goofy stuff. That was Freud. I stuck a cigar in his mouth too. Cigars was a big thing to him. Cigars, smoked lots of cigars. Then other things related to that image, I drew off of that. One of the things that comes up in psychoanalysis is a process called the creation of defense mechanism. So I drew a castle, a defensive position around a castle. And I knew what those the defense mechanisms that people use. But I put those together with images. Nowadays, people can do that with all kinds of electronic stuff. You can create um, audio pieces of information that help you connect, not just on a flat piece of paper. How does your brain work? Again, it's an individual thing. So that's a good place for us to quit. Anybody have a question? We're going to pick up on Thursday with how it is we construct memories and also the consideration of how accurate are those memories. You might be surprised how inaccurate your memories are from time to time, but that's another discussion for another day. Anything else? Skadoo, have some fun. Yes, those of you who asked me about recording, it looks like it has recorded everything it's supposed to today. It will process and I will hopefully, assuming it works, have it loaded for you. Otherwise, have a great day, folks. You too.